go back in history a little bit. Um, this is 1900, um, the Easter parade uh, on Fifth Avenue, New York. Can you see the picture okay? Yeah. Can anyone tell me where the car is? <laughs> where is the car? Sports oh. imagination. Okay, there. There is one car in 1900, Fifth Avenue, New York City. 1913. Can anyone tell me where the horse is? So I'm going to talk about disruption today. And I'll talk about what that means uh, in a second. But when disruption happens, it happens or it can happen very, very quickly. Um, and some of the things that I want to tell you today are already happening as we speak. Uh, and the disruption is going to happen very, very soon. Uh, so today's agenda, there are six technologies that I want to talk about, technology trends, and I'll put it together at the end. Um, and these are all happening as we speak. Uh, and they're changing and they're going to change massively uh, transportation over the next 5 to 15 years. So I want to start with electric vehicles. Um, you all know Tesla down the road in 2010, only four years ago, they launched the Roadster, um, which basically changed the conversation about electric vehicles, uh, and the Model S much more so. 200 plus miles of range, zero to 16, 3.7 seconds. You can fill it up for five bucks. Has anyone filled up your SUV or whatever it is for five bucks? Does anyone even remember a day when that was even possible. You can do that. Very good. Um, minor detail. It's $100,000. OK? Who can afford an electric vehicle? Right? Who can afford it? Um, and, and that's part of the disruption. So let me talk about disruption, just to make sure that we're all conceptually on, on the same page. Um, the classic disruption model is this. You start with a product that many consider toys or not good enough or, you know, think about the PCs 20, 30 years ago. Think about the cell phone. Think about MP3 players and so on. They started as, you know, quote unquote toys and they got better, they got cheaper, they improved and then they went on to disrupt, meaning to blow away the existing markets, mainframes or, or Walkman or whatever it was that they disrupted. Um, and, you know, basically in the beginning, uh, so it's just a matter of time. And the question is, how much time is it going to be before these products disrupt the existing infrastructure? And the, 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 one of the important things about disruption is that it's usually credible, quote unquote, experts who will tell you that these things are toys, that it's never going to happen, that, that you know, it, 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 it's going to be decades or hundreds of years before any, any of this makes any difference. Uh, but in fact, don't believe that. Um, so let me go back to horses and cars. The disruption, the gasoline car disruption happened within 12, 13, 15 years. Uh, because the gasoline car was a disruptive technology. There was nothing that horse uh, sellers, that horse carriage manufacturers could do to stop it. Nothing. It was just a matter of time. Okay? Um, so the question is, is the electric vehicle disruptive? Uh, I'll give you five reasons. I could stay here all afternoon, but uh, I know you don't want me to. Um, I'll give you five reasons why the electric vehicle is disruptive. Uh, one is that um, the electric motor is at least five times more fuel efficient, more energy efficient than the internal combustion engine. So your car probably um, uses only 17 to 20 percent to 21 percent of the gasoline to, and converts that into mechanical energy into movement. An electric motor 
converts 85 to 99 percent of the electricity in the battery into power. And there is nothing that manufacturers can do about this. There's a minor detail called the laws of thermodynamics that put a cap on how efficient internal combustion engines can be. Uh, number two, partly because of this, and partly because electricity is cheaper than, than gasoline or diesel, uh, EVs are at least 10 times cheaper to charge up, to fuel up, at least 10. And it all depends on how expensive gasoline or diesel uh, versus, versus electricity is in that uh, specific market. Um, not only to fill up, but also to maintain. So the gasoline engine, the ICE, internal combustion engine, car has drive shaft and pistons and uh, gears and valves and hundreds of parts that the uh, electric vehicle does not have. And all these parts blow up, burn up. Uh, as you know, I mean, every time we go to the, to the shop, how much do you spend, right? Um, the electric motor can last for decades, decades, without even needing a repair. Uh, wireless charging. Take that, Detroit. <laughs> I mean, uh, wireless inductive power transfer is a known technology. It's been around for 100 years. It was invented by the original Tesla, Nikola Tesla. Um, and wireless, uh, you know, anyone thinking about um, electric buses, you can actually power up the buses while they stop to pick up people and, 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 let, and let people off uh, and keep going. And by doing that, you basically can use a battery that's half the size. This, actually, this bus is in Italy, and, and, and it's been around for uh, years, actually. It's been, it's been working. Uh, and this is very important. The electric vehicle changes the price performance in a way that the internal combustion engine vehicle cannot compete with. So it totally changes the price performance. Um, Elon Musk recently said, the, the CEO of Tesla, that the Model X, the next the SUV that's coming in a couple of years, will have the performance of a Porsche 911 Carrera. Porsche 911 Carrera. And this is going to be a $35,000, $40,000 SUV. Now, there's nothing. So if you think about it, throughout the last century, we've worked on, on uh, we in the gasoline in Detroit, has worked on a price performance uh, basically line. The more performance, the higher the price, right? So you have the Porsche 911 Carrera, high price, high performance. And you have you know, the SUV, the Buick uh, Enclave, which is about $40,000, so mid-performance, mid-price. And that has been pretty much a constant throughout 100 years. Uh, but what's happening is that the Model X, the electric vehicle, is going to come at $40,000, so medium range in terms of pricing, but high range in terms of uh, performance. So it's totally going to shift the uh, basis of competition in a way that Detroit just cannot compete with. And when I say Detroit, I also mean Munich, by the way, Tokyo. Uh, I mean ICE, internal combustion engine vehicles. They will not be able to compete with electric vehicles at the same price level because the performance of those electric vehicles is going to be so much higher. Um, so you may have read, for instance, that the 2013 car of the year by Motor Trend was the Tesla Model S. They beat, uh, Consumer Reports actually said separately that the Model S was the best car they have ever tested. Not the best electric car, the best car they have ever tested. So, the Model S 
is now the number one luxury car seller in the United States. They're beating BMW, the large BMWs, the six, and they're, they're beating Mercedes, they're beating all the big brands. Because for the price, they're giving a much, much, much higher performance. They're changing the price performance, they're changing the basis of competition, and that's what a disruptive uh, product does. Now, okay, so believe that it's disruptive, the question is, how long will the transition take from basically today to the electric vehicle world? Um, the number one issue is the cost of batteries. That's holding back the, the, the industry. Yes, we need charging stations, but as a matter of fact, we have 40 to 50 million homes in America that have 220 to 40 plus, and those are good enough. Uh, we may want to upgrade them, but they're good enough. So we have 40 to 50 million uh, families that could potentially buy electric vehicles today without the need for additional charging stations. Assuming that the range of the EV is, I think, 200 miles is the minimum that, that, that a mainstream EV is going to need. So, um, the cost right now of batteries for electric vehicles is about $500 per kilowatt. It's been going down by about 16% per year, which is pretty good. So a 200 mile battery costs about 25K. Now, at three times the price, and bear with me, an EV would cost about three times the cost of the battery. That's an assumption I'm making. Um, the EV would be 75K. And this is just about what the Tesla Model S costs, about 70K. Um, and, but like I said, the cost of batteries is improving by about 16% per year. And if you map that out, I'm gonna show you what it looks like. Uh, a lot of companies in electronics, like Apple and Sanyo and Panasonic, in energy and in automotive, three multi-trillion dollar industries are investing in lithium ion and other types of batteries because it's important to all of them. And this is a technology that can be used in fact, you may know that Tesla uses uh, the same kind of small lithium-ion batteries that we use in electronics. Um, so, and they're investing five billion dollars in a new battery that uh, factory that's going to build 500,000 the batteries for 500,000 cars. They're going to open by 2017 and be fully open by 2020 and it's gonna further cut the costs of batteries. So here's what uh, my projection looks like. Uh, we're at the upper left side, about $70,000, 2014. It goes down 16% per year. Basically by 2017, 2018, that's when the industry will be able to deliver an SUV for about $40,000. So, like I said, no SUV in the market today will be able to compete with that. So, as soon as the EV industry goes down that curve, you can say that no gasoline vehicle can compete with that. That's the disruption happening. Um, further goes down, by 2020, um, the industry will be able to make a $31,000 EV that has a 200 mile range. By 2020, not 2040, right? By 2022, 2023, uh, the industry will be able to compete in the low end. So today, a Kia or whatever the low end is, costs about $20,000. So by 2022, the industry will disrupt even the low end. And you can keep that going to 2025, 2030. So here's the, my prediction, electric vehicles, the mass migration is gonna start around 2017, 2018, um, and it'll basically be over by 2025. But certainly, it'll be over by 2030. Over, kaput. So that transition that we saw from cars to cars is gonna happen from gasoline to electric vehicles. And of course, this is gonna disrupt not only uh, Detroit, but also gasoline. We don't need gasoline anymore by 2030. 
All right. So another technology, mobile internet. And that's already disrupting a lot of things. Buses, trains, cars, rides, parking. This is actually my uh, iPhone. That's actually a picture of my iPhone. I actually don't own a car. Uh, so I, you know, I talk about this because I, I use it. Pay uh, parking, I love this. I love to pay parking with my cell phone. I don't carry coins anymore. This is awesome, right? Thank you, city of San Francisco, and thank you, Stanford. Um, it, it, it so beats carrying coins. And from a city perspective, it's also great because um, you know, you can, um, it's convenient, it works for tolling and, and parking also. Um, and you know in real time, you can price it in real time, it's just, uh, so it's changing parking, right? Um, user generated traffic data. So every time we use Google Maps or Apple Maps or whatever, we're actually sending data, location data, movement data, all kinds of data to Google or Apple. And they're collecting millions and billions of data points, and they know more than pretty much anyone else what's going on in traffic. On top of that, uh, you may know a company called Waze. Uh, so it's not just that, that they're collecting Google. Uh, they just got acquired by Google, by the way, a few months ago. Um, in 2012, this company, so Waze is what's called social, uh, social mapping, social traffic. People actually uh, send messages to one another and say, hey, there's traffic here, you should go around, and so on and so forth. In 2012, 36 million ways users uh, made 500 million map edits. In some cities with like horrible traffic, ways is a must, must. Um, I mean, I've been overseas and in Sao Paulo, Brazil, everyone who drives has ways. In Istanbul, Turkey, everyone has ways. That's because they're telling one another uh, what to do. And of course, this is getting Google more, even more data. Where the gasoline is cheap, where the traffic is, where the alerts are, all that stuff. So user-generated data. Car sharing. I drove here today with a zip car. I've been a zip car member for seven years plus, right? That's my main mode of transportation. This is called car sharing. And I'm not the only one. They have probably, they may be up to a million now, but certainly 800,000 members. Um, and, and here's the, the thing about, so I rent it by the hour or by the day. It depends on what I need today by the hour. Sometimes when I go to Stanford by the day. Um, but here's the interesting thing in terms of transportation. Each uh, zip car, <laughs> serves 15 people. That's the uh, own to, to the share to own ratio. Meaning that 15 of us would have owned the car if we hadn't been members of a zip car. 15 to one, that's, that's pretty good. So 10,000 zip cars are out there instead of 150,000 that if we had all chosen to drive a car. Um, and that changes a lot of things about the ownership uh, the concept of car ownership. And, and anyone who uses Airbnb or, or uh, basically the, the, the concept of ownership is changing, not just in transportation in general. Ride sharing, so Uber, companies like Uber or Lyft or uh, Sidecar, basically these are competing with taxis. So there's a lot of spare capacity out there, people, uh, we only use our cars two hours a day. Cars are the second biggest capital investment that we make. We Americans, 40, 50, 60 grand, or maybe even more over four years, and yet they're parked 90% of the time. So isn't there a better way to use this spare capacity? And so companies like Lyft and so on, they're using it. Uh, and in doing that, so, so to give you one idea, Uber, which is a company in San Francisco, and it's all based on an app. They have an app, you call Uber, your new click, and a car is 
basically tells you, I'll take you for 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever, um, and I'll be there in five minutes, all with this mobile internet cell phone. Um, last year, they were, Uber was started in 2009. Last year, they collected a billion dollars. They made 20%, so they made $200 million, okay? Uh, in less than four years, from idea to 200 million. And they're growing like crazy. They're already in 60 cities, and Google, again, invested $250 million into Uber. And it'll be clear in a second, in a few minutes, why. Uh, so mobile internet, smartphones are changing transportation in meaningful ways. They're, they're, they're helping users connect, they're helping users generate data, um, and also they're enabling new business models like Zipcar and, 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 and Uber um, that use some of the spare capacity and make car ownership uh, uh, maybe obsolete even. And the taxi industry is being disrupted as we speak. In the city in San Francisco, I mean, they're like, uh, if they don't do really heavy lifting and develop their own apps and so on, they're, they're gonna be obsolete pretty soon. Um, so let me talk about sensors. Anyone here with a cell phone, with an Android, with um, an iPhone, has at least a dozen, if not two dozen sensors. You're walking around with a couple dozen sensors. Um, sensors are everywhere. They're getting cheaper. They're getting smarter. They're getting connected. Um, you know, a sensor that was 20 bucks 10 years ago is Two dollars and will be twenty cents in five years, and two cents in fifteen years. Um, they they really uh, we're reading everything. Everything that can be measured will be measured. So this is what uh, an Android. Uh, I'm showing you the Galaxy has light sensors and movement and GPS and humidity and temperature and all kinds of things. And every new iteration, they add more sensors. Why? Because it's cheap and it can provide a lot of information. So, um, you know, get used to everything that can be measured, will be measured, everywhere, all the time. They're developing little, you know, sensor-based devices for cats and dogs so that people know their, you know, state of mind, uh, uh, literally, at all times, right? Uh, you know, athletes, they're using Fitbit. I mean, that's a sensor-based device. And um, the, the market has just exploded. Some types of sensors are growing, not just 100% per year, 700%. I mean, um, look at some of these numbers, 700%, 500% per year, per year. Um, the industry is predicting the trillion sensor world, T-sensor. And some people are predicting even 100 trillion sensors per year. Now, let me tell you, 10 trillion sensors, there are 7 billion people. That's 1,000 sensors per person per year, OK? And every little sensor is generating a ton of data about you, about your car, about traffic, about everything around us. Okay, so sensors are changing everything. Um, and let me give you an example. I, I mentioned that, that I don't own a car, but my girlfriend does. Volvo, 2000 Volvo. It's a great car, but that little car, uh, the, 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 the light, the engine light, is a nuisance. Every time the engine, check engine, you know, uh, check engine light. We don't know if the car is going to explode. <laughs> Right? Or if it's just, you know, we need to go wash it. <laughs> we don't know because it just says check engine. Right? So what I did, you know, being a good boyfriend, was I bought this sensor-based device um, for a hundred bucks that tells me basically the trip timeline, but also it gives me all the codes. So I plug it in, 100 bucks, it's easy to plug in, and it tells me, here are the actual codes from, so thankfully, 
the car was not going to blow up. Uh, you know, we went on the, on the on the internet and we checked what these meant, and it was just a nuisance, right? Um, it alerts my friends or whoever I want if there's a, a, a crash, all for a hundred bucks. So these are the types of sensors that I'm that I'm talking about. So even a two thousand Volvo um, basically can 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 get these type of sensors, and not only that. Um, this is another sensor-based uh, device uh, in, in, in the city. And you know, very little, they're, they're, they're tiny. They have a different business model. What they're offering is insurance, car insurance, by the mile. Now think about it. They will know everything about the engine, everything about your movement, how fast you accelerate, you know, do you drive 80 miles per hour? Do you drive 30 miles per hour? They will know everything about the movements of the car more than any insurance company knows. So they will be able to run the numbers and say, you know what? I can offer insurance to this person or to this car for this much. So they will start picking off uh, customers from the insurance industry. The insurance industry, the car insurance industry, will be disrupted if they don't uh, adopt this kind of technologies. Another type of sensor-based uh, uh, world in transportation, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. The Department of Transportation is also getting into, into this uh, uh, business. They're uh, talking to all car companies to see if we can uh, add transponders to every car. I don't know when it's, it's gonna happen, but even if it doesn't officially happen, it is happening with folks like me plugging, plugging in our, our sensors. But vehicle to vehicle communication is possible. New cars have these, these kind of technologies. Um, but it's not just vehicle to vehicle. Uh, we'll be able to, with traffic lights, we'll be able to communicate with cars, cars with cars. We'll be able to communicate with you know, school zones. Um, so basically, everything will be able to communicate with everything that moves or doesn't move. Right? I mean, think about that. Think about the possibilities uh, in terms of managing traffic. Now, if you put all that together, all those sensors, all that data generated by people, all that data generated by <clears throat> cars and traffic lights and so on, uh, what we get is something called the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is data about things so that things communicate, things pile up the data. And, and, and the, the, there's a data explosion that's coming out of this thing called the Internet of Things, right? Everything will be connected. Literally, we're all going to be one. In, in, you know, not just because we're Zen, but because all <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to be connected by data. Um, trillions of sensors, imagine that. Um, so we can see things when we look at all this data uh, live as a, we can see transportation as a living, breathing organism, as it happens in microseconds. I mean, planning is never going to be the same again in terms of transportation. Um, so basically, the, the, the thing about sensors, they're everywhere, they're growing. They're going to be growing by a thousand times over the next 10 years, and everything will be connected to everything else, uh, in transportation, people, and so on and so forth. Uh, so let me tell you about uh, self-driving cars. Has anyone seen one of these? Yes. What do you think? Interesting. They had the test down in San Diego. They, they are or they're not? They were testing. They were testing. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're testing. Pretty much all over California, and 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 uh, uh, she can drive it. She can drive it if she wants, but she doesn't have to. It's a self-driving car. It parks itself. It charges itself. Now look at the radius when it parks. Only an electric vehicle can do that. Think of it. Look at it. Because they're all independent. All wheels are independent. So, self-driving cars are going to be electric. So it's 
not just about self-driving. Thank you, go away. All right? So that is two years old, that already exists. Um, the chief designer of Nissan spoke in my class in the fall about what they were doing. Um, Google Car, you've heard about it. It's already, you can see it driving around sometimes. Um, the Google Car has gone a half a million miles without a single accident, self-driving. Actually, it had one accident, somebody rear-ended, a human <laughs> rear-ended the Google Car. Um, so, the, you know, the technology is just, uh, is there. Um, and what you're talking about is, it's called LiDAR. Uh, this is laser uh, technology sensor that, that basically allows the car to see. Now this LiDAR was $70,000 two years ago, now it's $10,000. Mm -hmm. I know an entrepreneur that's building a company to make them for $1,000. So cost is not gonna be an issue either. I mean, all these technologies are decreasing uh, exponentially. This is what a Google car sees. This is what a LiDAR picture looks like. People and trees and cats and so on and so forth. Um, it's, it's basically like laser radar because it, it bounces back from the phone. Now, um, LiDAR is not the only technology. I show it because it's the Google car, which, which is the better known here. Um, Fujitsu is making a semiconductor to read uh, video feeds and paint a picture that the car can see, uh, and it costs 50 bucks. 50 bucks, semiconductor, okay? So again, cost is not gonna be the main issue. Are uh, users gonna be ready for um, self-driving cars? In Brazil, 95% of, of drivers say that yes, they will use a self-driving car. Not only that, a high percent says yes, I will let my kids go in a self-driving car. And I'm 60% in the US. And my guess is people who drive on the 101 or the 5 or the 880 are in this 90%, okay? Uh, so it's probably gonna be dependent on the, how bad the traffic is. But, but you know, people, uh, already in surveys uh, accept these, these uh, self-driving cars. Now, when are they gonna happen? That's not really a big question because, in fact, they're already happening. If you look at high-end cars, if you look at the Audi and the Mercedes and the Lexus and BMW and so on, they already have a lot of technologies that would be classified as self-driving. They park themselves, they, they, they can cruise on the highways up to 30 miles per hour without touching the wheel. Uh, ACC, stop and go, lane assist, all these technologies are already in cars. It's not a big jump, really. Uh, the Department of Transportation has this five level uh, road to autonomy um, uh, framework from zero to four. Uh, where they say, okay, where are we in, in, in this when we talk? Uh, we're already in level three. I mean, there are a lot of cars from Nissan and BMW and Google and so on that are already in the next to last level before full automation. So again, technology is not gonna be the main uh, problem in, in, in terms of adoption. Nissan has announced that they're going to launch their um, fully autonomous automobile by 2020, six years. I would be surprised if someone does not launch way before that. So it's gonna depend on regulations and all those kind of things, but I would be surprised if somebody doesn't uh, launch before 2020. And Nissan also said that within two iterations, two generations of cars, every single car that they make is gonna be, have the autonomy technology, whether people choose to drive or not. So by 2025 or so, every car that Nissan makes, 
according to what they say, will be autonomous. And of course, in a competitive world, everyone will have to uh, try to do that as well. Now, here's, here's what's, what, what, what I find interesting beyond the fact that we don't have to sit in traffic for an hour or two every day. You know, we'll be able to do whatever, Facebook or Word or read a book or any other things, right? Uh, today, at 60 miles per hour on normal traffic, 95% of highway space is unused. Humans are not great drivers. <laughs> we leave way too much space in between. We need too much space in between. Sideways, I mean, lanes are about twice the size of the cars. 95%. Um, I mean, a lot of people complain about not enough highways. In fact, we have too much space in terms of highways, right? Now, check out what happens when you have um, autonomous cars. If all you have is, a, if every car had that adaptive cruise control, which is a technology that already exists, that in and of itself would improve highway capacity by 40%. If you had just ACC and inner vehicle communication, that would improve highway capacity by 273%, just those two technologies. That already exists, okay? So just, just that will tell you that autonomous vehicles will increase highway capacity by almost four times. By four times. So we will have too many highways soon. We will. You don't believe it, but we will, right? Uh, now here's a disruptive business model, car as a service. I mentioned that I don't own a car because I have access to a car anytime that I want. Now imagine that Zipcar, instead of parking a block or two from my place, had a self-driving car. And I just called it and said, I need a car in five minutes. Boom, it would be in front of me, it would drop me out here, and it would go pick somebody else up. So cars would go from 90% of the time parked to 90% of the time working going around, think about that. Now what does that mean in terms of the need for parking? Basically, 80 to 90% of parking is not gonna be needed when the car as a service model is, you know, basically is adopted everywhere. So again, I know that you have issues with zoning and this and that. Parking is gonna be obsolete very soon. 80 to 90% of parking spaces gone within 15 years. Not zero. Thank you. It's, it's the truth. I mean, LA, you must be from LA. Uh, yeah. Um, so basically, uh, my, 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 numbers, my numbers basically say that 80 to 90% of parking spaces are not going to be needed in a world of car as a service, uh, 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 fully automated car. And that's going to happen very soon. Um, so, again, summary potential for 80% fewer cars on the road. If all cars are automated, we don't need to own them. We just need to call them. So why do we need to, you know, basically if they're working 90% of the time? Uh, it's going to change the concept of car ownership. There's going to be excess parking space and excess highways. Um, so that's going to be an opportunity to redesign our cities. What are we gonna do with that extra space? Think about that. Okay, nano satellites and drones. Uh, this is the Caltrans Traffic Management Center in Oakland. You know, it looks like a NASA kind of display. It looks very impressive, but it's already up to it. Um, you know, I, I, I took pictures of these technologies, which happen to be from the 80s. The microprocessor that's running these traffic lights are from the 80s. They might as well use this phone. <laughs> okay? You know, I, I know there's budget issues and all that, but 22 cameras in Northern California, that is not going to be good enough, right? So let's fast forward to 2013-14. Um, this is 
Stanford University, the new bioengineering building, which is about to open up. And um, let me show you this. So the roof inspection for this building, this is the actual video of the roof inspection for the new Stanford bioengineering building. This is an unmanned aerial vehicle, better known as drone. Drones are getting so cheap, this drone is a thousand bucks. Anyone can buy a drone. And look at the images that we get from a drone. taking pictures, videos, audios. Um, Facebook apparently has acquired this company called uh, Titan Air Aerospace, and they make solar drones <coughs> that basically are gonna be up in the air for five years. Five years uh, taking pictures and videos. They say it's for Wi-Fi. Sure. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, what I'm saying to you is that these things can be used for transportation and traffic management and all that good stuff. So instead of uh, 20 locations, you can have a thousand of these flying around. Uh, they cost a million bucks, but the drones cost a thousand bucks. Um, okay. So, nano satellites. The Landsat satellite that we're used to cost a billion dollars. Now, we're getting satellites, you know how big these are? 12 inches. This big. So this is another startup company in San Francisco. Um, this big. And these satellites, this is about a dozen or two that were just launched. And they cost 40K. That's it, 25 Ds less than the cost of less than a million bucks. So these can be used again for traffic management and for, for mapping and, and, and agriculture and all those kind of uh, things. And they have the resolution of a single car. Um, so again, uh, drones are gonna change the way that we see uh, and can manage uh, transportation. And one last thing I wanna talk about is big data. And I'm probably going to run out of time, I apologize. Big data. All of these technologies, electric vehicles, self-driving cars, smartphones, sensors, drones, all of them are nothing if not data generation machines. All of them. Uh, the explosion of data about transportation is just overwhelming. Um, and it's also changing transportation forever. The Google self-driving car, each one generates one gigabyte per second. Per second. I mean, your PC will be filled up in a minute or two with one self-driving. I mean, imagine a million of these. I mean, how many cars in California? 10 million? Imagine all of these things generating cars, uh, data, right? So think about this. The number of sensor-based devices are growing exponentially. The number of sensors within each device are growing exponentially. The amount of data that each sensor generates is also growing exponentially. So we're talking about exponential within exponential within exponential, right? Um, and the number of connections between all of these devices and sensors and so on is also growing more than exponentially. So what we're getting in transportation is a combinatorial explosion 
of data. I mean, the data that's being generated and will continue to be generated is going to be astonishing beyond just having that Caltrans management center with 20 uh, video cameras. Uh, so your role is going to be more to look at this you know, big data thing and to bring wisdom and insight out of that. So, so, so it's, it's, it's a big role, it's more analytics and, and you'll be able to do it in real time and I'll offer a couple of ideas. Um, but I want to show you what MIT is doing. MIT, um, they, they have a program called Sensible City Sensors, so connecting cities and sensors and all. Uh, they looked at data for New York City taxi cabs for a year, 2011. Uh, 13,000 taxis made 150 million trips. And here's one of the things they discovered. 80% of those trips could have been shared if you know, the, 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 the taxis had made just a two minute uh, detour. Two minutes, 80%. Now if that's true, that means that you could cut taxi trips by 40% just by allowing taxis to pick up more than one person. So a tweak in regulation can save 40% of taxi trips, 40% of gasoline, 40% and, and, and there's congestion, right? And this is the kind of insight that you can only get with this massive data from sensors and from cars and so on and so forth. And that changes the way that we do policy and regulation, right? Um, so the, uh, another thing interesting that they found was that out of all those trips, 73,000 taxi trips went from Grand Central to Union Square, and 90,000 from Union Square to Grand Central. So you have 160,000 taxi trips going from these two trips, which are these two dots, which are about a mile away, 1.4 miles, right? So you want to cut back on congestion, you want to you know, make life easier and so on. Let, let me show you just an idea that, that I thought about. We're here at CES trying out the Navio, which is a self-driving shuttle. It's uh, very cool. It's actually used for uh, locations such as college campuses or the military or even corporate campuses. Self-driving shuttle. So what if, what if <coughs> instead of having 100,000 taxi trips, you have one of these shuttles going back and forth? It's for tourism, it's more environmentally correct, it's all that good stuff, just an idea. But the point is that you'll have the data and the insight from all that data to make changes in transportation according to what you see today, right? Um, so let me, let me summarize my, my talk, and again, I apologize, I'm a couple of minutes uh, late. Um, the, the, this is all what I call the clean disruption. The clean disruption of energy and transportation. Energy and transportation are becoming one. Again, not in the Zen way, but um, uh, the, 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 the separate internal combustion engine world of gasoline and so on is going to basically be uh, obsolete very soon. Um, but I want to take you back to New York City again, to 1900. And, and this is a world of horses. And what I did not tell you, and it looks cute and romantic and all that, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, does anyone know the horseman war crisis? <laughs> I mean, that, you think you have problems. So in 1880, before actually the number of horses peaked in New York City, they had 175,000 horses wow. producing four million pounds of poop every single day, okay, on New York City streets, day in and day out. Now this caused a massive crisis in city planning. And when I say New York City, I also mean London and Sydney and Paris and every large uh, city, right? Wealthy city. Um, you know, environmental. I mean, imagine four million pounds when it rains. Imagine the, the exactly, exactly, smelly, uh, horrible in the summer, 
they would pile this up in vacant lots up to six feet high. Okay, so the summer was not better than the winter. Um, you know, healthcare, three billion flies would hatch in all this poop in US cities uh, per day. Three billion flies per day, causing massive outbreaks in disease and typhoid and, and so on and so forth. Congestion, I mean, imagine horses are very hard to manage. Uh, congestion was really bad. And death, uh, 15,000 dead horses per year had to be carted away in New York City. And 200 people died per year, killed by horses. That, on a per capita basis, was higher than the number of people who die in car accidents today in New York City. Okay? So it, it was a massive crisis. What happened was, in 1898, it, 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 they called the first worldwide conference, um, urban planning conference, right? something like this, first worldwide. Uh, in New York, and the topic was the horse manure crisis because it was such a huge problem. Uh, I mean, in, in, in London, they were forecasting that that poop was going to go up to every second floor uh, by 1930 or 1950. Yes. I mean, every prognosticator was saying we're going to drown in this thing. Okay, um, so. They called this conference, it was a 10-day conference, and after three days, they called it off. There's no new ideas. No new ideas. I mean, the things that we're talking about, we've talked about for 100 years, there's nothing new. So they shut it down and everyone went home, to Sydney and to London and wherever. They could not do anything about the horse food crisis, okay? Now, this is 1913. From that massive horse food crisis to this picture, took 15 years. What solved it was a technology revolution called the internal combustion engine COP. It solved all those environmental issues and health issues and, 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 and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, of course, this, the car, has become the horse manure problem of the 21st century. Right? Greenhouse gases and congestion and parking and, and all that stuff. Um, so the technologies, the organizations, the planning processes, the culture of the industrial revolution that cleaned up that horse poop have already run out, of course, uh, of steam. Now we're entering, we have already entered the information technology revolution. And the technologies that I've talked about today, make no mistake, the electric vehicle is a mobile computer on wheels. The self-driving car is a mobile computer. I mean, it's, it's driven by computers, by artificial intelligence, in a battery and software and an operating system, just like your computer, okay? The next 15 years, we'll see more changes in transportation than we have seen in 100 years, not since 1900, okay? Make no mistake about that. These are some of the key technologies that will make this happen. This will be over. Uh, the clean disruption is gonna make our cities cleaner, healthier, and less congested. We're gonna need less parking, fewer highways, they're not going to be as polluting as, 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 uh, as the inter internal combustion engine. This is all going to happen within 15 years, make no mistake. Um, and the cities that lead the clean disruption, just like Detroit led the internal combustion engine disruption back then and became a great city, not anymore. Um, but um, the, the cities that lead the clean disruption are going to lead the 21st century. Just like Detroit was the center of, 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 of manufacturing and wealth generation for decades, those are the cities that are gonna lead the 21st century. And this is not in the future. This revolution, this disruption, 
is happening now. It's happening as we speak. Thank you.